we're now going to get into our first panel session uh, this morning. We have, we have a number of them set up for you, eight over the course of the next three days. This is our first one, uh, and it's an important one, obviously. Uh, we're dealing with the state of research. We've already gotten some insights about what's happening in different parts of, of the world, both within the European Union and in the United States on, the, on this topic. But we're going to go into it now in significant detail over the next 90 minutes. Uh, we have with us Dr. Joachim Harms. He's head of marine and maritime research, uh, geosciences and shipping at the Research Center and Project Management Organization, uh, Juli. Uh, he is going to lead this discussion, introduce the panelists, and uh, also open the floor for discussion at the end. We'll have about 45 minutes for that. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Terry. So, good morning. I'm delighted to present you my panelists, and I would like to ask the panelists to come up to the all podium here, and uh, I think the first panelist is uh, Professor Katja Mattis from the GEOMAR, and uh, she is now, I think, hopefully with us with Zoom. And uh, the next person I would... Is there, is there Katja Mattis coming up with Zoom? I... Oh, there, there she is. I highly welcome Professor, uh, director, the director of the GEOMAR Center, Katja Mattis, here in the audience, and I'm delighted that you are here with us with Zoom. Thank you for that. And the next person I would like to the podium is uh, Wim de Klerk. He is the program manager of ammunition safety at the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific and Research, short TNO. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Catherine Warner. She is director of the NATO Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation in La Spezia, and we already heard about La Spezia today. So welcome to the podium. And Professor Dr. Edmund Maser, he is the director of the Institute for Toxicology and Pharmacology at the Christian Albrecht University here in Kiel. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. As we already heard, Munition in the sea was once a quick and a low-cost solution to get rid of the immense amount of remaining explosives after the wars. And nowadays, it, we already also heard, these dumped munition are a major threat for the marine environment, as recent research demonstrated, and this was clearly also mentioned by Fabrizio Constantino just in the talk before. But it's also a risk for us as consumers because the marine food is really affected by the metabolites of TNT and it's an uncalculated risk and by that this is returning back to our plates and uh, it's also a threat for us as humans. The munition in the sea really requires uh, well-defined action, and I think this is a topic which we have today here, how science and scientific research can really contribute for a good risk assessment and management strategies in future how to handle the problem. So I'm delighted now that the speakers will give you a short 10-minute introductory speech about the state of research from their perspective and later on, then we have discussion time, about 50 minutes, and I am really welcome you later on to join the discussion and uh, to really address your questions to the panelists here on the podium. So the first speaker would be Katja Mattis, and I really ask you to give your presentation. So, good morning, everyone. Um, do you hear me and can you see the screen? I have to look over there. <laughs> Fine, it's working. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah, so sorry, I couldn't join you in person, but I decided to take my, to not take my germs into the audience. So, <clears throat> luckily, um, this meeting is a hybrid meeting, so I'm able to join from home. 
So, um, welcome from, from my side, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to give you an overview on the state of research about marine munition in Germany, and in particular, what we are doing at GEOMAR, at the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, based here in Kiel. This is work um, of the groups um, of Professor Jens Greinert and Professor Eric Achterberg, and they will be um, talking also later during the week. I would like to take you um, on a journey, on an underwater journey, for the next um, 10 minutes to give you an overview. <clears throat> Okay, so the, the problem of dumped munition in Germany is shown on this map, which presents you the German Baltic and North Sea with different types of munition related areas. You've seen a similar map um, just in the presentation before. And we've also heard already many times how much munition has been dumped um, after, after the world wars. Um, 1.6 million tons of conventional munition in the north, mostly in the north, but also in the Baltic Sea. And this is equivalent to a freight train from Paris to Moscow. Also this we've heard this morning from Jens Wendt, um, 2,500 kilometers. So it's a huge amount. And as the minister president said, it's really an urgent topic to finding solutions. And um, so until 2011, research was very limited um, about munition. Um, but now you can see on this map the munition in German waters. And you see three colored areas. These are dump sites in red, contaminated areas, and potentially contaminated areas in yellow and orange. And I've put you a few marks here. We are sitting, or you are sitting in Kiel, Today, north of Hamburg and north of Kiel is Flensburg, and to the east is the North Sea, and to the, to the west is the North Sea, and to the east, the Baltic Sea. And I will show you two examples um, today from dump sites um, in the Baltic Sea, and one is just out of the Kiel Fjord, Kohlberger Heide, and the other one is in Lübeck Bay. And on the right-hand side, you see a video um, where you can see many piles of munition boxes in Lübeck Bay. I will show you more pictures um, later on. But first of all, um, what about marine munition research in Germany? In 2011, the first report about marine munition in German waters was published. And there was a strong push, push from the ministry towards academia to engage in this problem. And since 2015, so six years ago, a stronger impulse towards also technological development started and environmental research. And the research covers basically the whole chain, which is very important from the detection to the munition removal. And you can see here all the steps um, that I would like to quickly go through. So the first step, of course, is munition detection and quantification methods. Then to assess environmental and toxicological impact, impacts. And we will hear more um, from Edmund Maser in a minute. Uh, then developments of decision support tools, standardization of munition surveys and clearances, munition clearance technologies for dump sites, and um, at the end, of course, munition disposal of lar large quantities. And GEOMAR is not the only research center in Germany that is involved in munition uh, research. You can see on the right-hand side in the top, uh, top right corner, also our colleagues from AVI, from the IOW, and Warnemünde, from the Thunen Institute, Fraunhofer, the University of Rostock, and um, the UKSH in <coughs> Kiel. And of course, in particular, the munition clearance technologies um, are an excellent opportunity to cooperate with industries and companies, besides is Egeos, which uh, was renamed to North.io, I just learned this morning, and um, other companies in Kiel and um, in the surroundings. 
So what are we doing at GUMAR? Um, since 2013, um, so almost nine years, GUMAR has extensive experience in marine chemical analytics, in hydroacoustics and optical mapping, in marine technologies, including AUVs, and processing of large data sets. And um, I would like to go through our research questions. And while I'm going through the questions, you can have a look at the pictures. On the right-hand side, you see a diver um, placing a measurement tool over um, a pile of munition to investigate the ecological impact um, and disturbances surrounding munition. And on the right-hand corner, you see a photo mosaic from Kohlberger Heide, one of the dump sites just out of the Kiel Fjord um, with brown mines, sea mines, and torpedo heads. So the research questions include how many, where, and what types of munition occurs in German waters? What is the state of corrosion? And to what extent are munition objects buried and moved over time? What are the concentrations and spatial differences of munition compounds in German waters? How fast are munition compounds or abbreviated MCs released into the water? And how are these compounds distributed through currents? What is the impact on the ecosystem now, but also in the future? How to integrate munition relevant data in a federated way. And to do so, uh, there are several steps and also technological developments at GeoMar that I would like to show you on this slide. We do many technological advancements and develop new tools, methods, and workflows. Um, we develop hard and software technologies, and you can see two examples or yeah, two examples um, on the right hand side in um, on the pictures. So we have a UV based a UV stands for autonomous underwater vehicle based targeted munition mapping detection and verification and you can see one of our latest AUVs, the AUV Louise on the right hand side with magnetometers and a camera that is moving slowly through water and mapping um, areas with munition. We also um, investigate AI-based munition identification. So artificial intelligence is very important to neural networks to put pictures that we take with the AUV together in order to come up with an entire picture of the munition dump sites. And I will show you examples in a minute. And then the third thing is chemical analyses of conventional munition compounds. And you can see two of our scientists on board of an research vessel um, doing the analysis with a mass spectrometer um, during, during the expedition. OK, so I promised to show you a, a couple of pictures. This example is now from Lübeck Bay. Um, this is an example from a heavily contaminated region. In the lower left corner, you see the Lübeck Bay. And then we zoom into these areas with the dump sites. And on the right-hand side, in the upper corner, you, you can zoom into the area and you see this little blue circles at a depth of about 20 meters where you can find um, different objects, piles of munition boxes, um, and so forth. So as I said, Lübeck Bay is heavily contaminated in two distinct dump sites. And we went there a couple of times, several times, measured with our AUVs and also with a mass spectrometer. The surprising thing is that Less munition was detected than expected from archive studies, and we can talk about why this is so, or what might be the reason for this. Um, chemical contamination is very eminent, and um, this area could become a pilot area for large-scale remedy. So how does it 
look like in reality. These are bathymetric um, maps, which show you the, the seafloor, um, basically, and uh, disturbances on the seafloor. But we can also um, do real pictures. And um, on the left-hand side, you see um, video, which shows you different munition boxes, bombs, um, and so forth. And um, we do, and the experts, uh, or the real experts, we are not the real experts, um, know what is in these boxes. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see an image, um, <coughs> which is quite um, detailed with, um, it's an auto, auto mosaic um, picture. And uh, this looks maybe not so, spectacular for you, but it is. And if you talk to Jens Breinert, who is the expert and will give you more information on how these pictures are put together on uh, Thursday, I believe, he gets really excited um, about this picture because it is put together from images from 2,300 single images. And um, so this the site on the right hand side is 12 meters times 12 meters. And these images are acquired by our AUV. And you can see, or you can believe us, um, we've counted them. There are 214 boxes um, in that pile. So this is really um, a fantastic way of um, showing crystal clear pictures of of a munition site and um, here as an example. And as, as I said, Jens Greinert will give a talk um, about detection and identification on Wednesday in session four um, during the session, detection and identification technologies. So last, um, I would like to show you this. Um, this map, um, which shows the chemical contamination in the Baltic Sea. And again, um, <clears throat> you can see the, the Baltic Sea area where you see the green circles. This is Kiel Fjord, and where you see the big orange circles, this is Lübeck Bay, where I just showed you the pictures. We've taken more than 2,000 water samples which show a clear contamination of water with munition compounds. There was no sample without detectable okay. compound. Professor Mattes, just another minute, please. Yes, this is my last slide. Okay, I'm almost fine. Um, and there is high concentration um, found at the known dump sites that I showed you in the very first um, picture. And what we recommend is um, a regular monitoring, um, of course, and um, many contaminants um, need to be measured to see the entire picture. And the measurements started in 2018, or measurements that are shown here in 2018 and 2020, but we go regularly um, to measure these, um, the chemical contamination. And um, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and hand over to Joachim Harms again. Thank, Thank you. you for your presentation. <clears throat> I think this really gives a very good insight about the situation here in the Baltic Sea and uh, about the activities also going along with GEOMA. And uh, I think GEOMA is one of the leading uh, research institutions in this topic, but as Katja Mathe shows up, it's always a really joint effort also in conjunction with other institutions and research activities. So it's a joint effort on the German side. And since 2016, there are a lot of projects going on. The most known may be in UDEM and RODEM, Robem, which were funded jointly by the research ministry and the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And I think also there we will come later on in, in more detail. But now I want hand, to hand over to Wim de Klerk to give his presentation, and I hope that it was possible to really upload his most recent presentation. So we are looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chairman. It's working. Um, I want to tell something what we are doing in the Netherlands at TNO regarding the sheet definition, the international rules. Yeah, I was looking for the, the clicker. Yeah, thank you. During my, during my talk, I want to focus on international development and international cooperation. Of course, I think all the work that we are doing costs a lot of time, a lot of money, and it's not work we can do alone. First, a few words about TNO. We are an independent R&D organization, uh, quite big in the Netherlands, more than 3,000 people. And we try to connect everybody, people, knowledge, universities, and industry. And that's the reason that we have the slogan, Innovation for Life. On the right side, you can see all the different units of TNO. And the main topic, this could be clear, is defense, safety, and security, where we are working on, on the energetic materials. Is that on your screen? I have it here on my screen, yes, sorry. Yeah, but the big one is not showing up. Ah. By now. Ah, by now. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, TNO is established in 1932, and in 1947 we start, or 1946, just after the Second World War, we start the TNO Defense Safety and Security Area. Uh, it's a group of about 1,000 people at the moment working in that field. And in that way, we are working as an extension of the Dutch MOD. Of course, the Dutch MOD doesn't have any laboratories for doing research or analysis. So all that work is forwarded to uh, TNO. And there is a strict control because we have the Council for Defense Research, which is headed by a former high-ranking uh, military people, uh, who has an influence on the steps we will do in the future. And that is what we are doing. And what are we doing regarding sea dump munition? It's at least it's the right presentation. I put them all on. In the Netherlands, we have a few spots. <coughs> Uh, maybe not as big as the, the Black Sea, but in the North Sea, we dumped about 60,000 tons of ammunition. Another one, it's more intern, is in the Oosterschelde, where we dumped about 30,000 tons of ammunition. It sounds maybe as a lot, maybe as not, but it's quite detailed. We know quite exactly what is dumped there after the Second World War. <coughs> and it is dumped in front of Sierra Xee. So when you they stand in the area of Syrix Sea and you look to the sea, it's only maybe 50 meter. And there they dumped all the ammunition in a quite broad area. And it differs from place to place, but the, there are places where it is 60 meter deep before you will reach the ammunition. And it's all covered by sand and clay. And sometimes there is two or three meter sand above the ammunition, which makes it very difficult to take it out, to analyze it, and on the other hand, to predict what is the, de the degradation of your material and the corrosion. And most of the people, they have only one uh, criteria, and they are worried about that's the environmental effect. What is the environmental effect for the fishermen, for the mussels, etc.? Now, later on, uh, Professor uh, Maas will tell more about what will be the effect of energetic materials in uh, fish. So this is what <coughs> is mentioned, and um, partly in Oosterschelde, partly in the North Sea, and then I will skip that one. This is the one we picked out a few months ago. We did one campaign, and we looked to the ammunition, and as you can see, there is a different state of corrosion, but there is still some energetic material behind. Uh, also due to the large amount of water, which is flooding up, uh, over it, and, all this, and the sand and all the different conditions, still you can detect some energetic materials. So the main things what TNO is doing in this case is taking water and soil samples, analyze them in international cooperation, and giving an advice to the Ministry of Defense. So what is going on? internationally, and I want to focus on NATO, because I think most of the, the strongest point is to get all the people together in a community. Uh, European Union is one of the things, it's more open for industry, 
when we look for more in the military area and want to share information, which is maybe on the level of confidential, it's easier to do that under the umbrella of NATO. And I took one picture to show all the different groups, and that are not all of them, because I missed one of them, and that is CMRA, and they will present later. And it's another organization working in this field, but I want to focus on the panels. There are a few panels working in different areas, and the biggest one, and uh, also for energetic materials and munitions, the most important one is AVT, Applied Vehicle Technology. It's very difficult to explain why munition belongs to AVT. But after a few years of struggling with the group, we managed it and we started up very good projects. And I must say, they are running quite well. Because AVT is focusing on performance, affordability and safety. And safety is one of the things of them termination. Of vehicle platform propulsion and power systems. Now, then we have the energetic materials. In all environments for new and aging systems through uh, advancement of appropriate technologies. And that's why we are focusing on inside NATO. Which techniques can we use to detect the ammunition in different locations? And how can we perform the analysis? When we look back for 2016 in Bulgaria, it was also mentioned during one of the other presentations, but in Bulgaria they did a lot of work. And we arranged to have there a uh, four days workshop. And the last day was a technical visit, but three days with papers, discussions. And the main objective of that group was <coughs> examining the risk to NATO post by underwater sessions of uh, conventional munitions through presentation, discussion, experience and problems. So we start there the discussion, including um, the other groups from NATO, not only AVT, to look what can we do together. And the topics which I mentioned here was the quantities, locations, environmental risk. How can we set up our models for corrosion? How can we set up our models of distribution? What is the influence of uh, the stream of the water? As follow-up on this one, we started another group, a little bit smaller and shorter. It was a one-year program, an exploratory team. And to say, what are the gaps for the management of underwater dumped conventional munitions? What are we still missing? Is it only the model for corrosion? Is it only the way of detection, which is also very difficult? And I must say, the people in the US by uh, CERDEP did a lot of programs for that, detection of underwater munitions. And um, to fill the gaps, we start working on looking what are the things. Is it only dump munition? Do we have the shipwrecks, uh, like in the Thames in the UK, in London? Can we look for the impact of corrosion? Is the corrosion in all the cases the same? When we look for the environment, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, North Sea, freshwater, uh, the, the depth of the dump munition is popping up also. Based on this uh, project, we start with a new project, which is now running. And that is to uh, look for the assessment of the impact from underwater munitions and the integration of the results from non-NATO studies. So we also start looking to uh, DPI and, all the, and the European Union. Bring it all together and to find the solution and the, uh, the projects. And this project is still running and it's uh, chaired from, uh, of participated from Germany by uh, Professor Edmund Maser and Dr. Klaus Butger and from Poland from Professor Jacek Beltodowski and I know that all the three are here in the room. Uh, we started with the project uh, last year, and uh, it's shared by uh, Professor Adam Cumming from the University of Edinburgh, together with uh, Dr. Klaus Butger, and they tried to bring the group, and I, I don't know exactly the number, but I think it's something like 15 people at the moment, discussing the whole thing from assessment and how to look for the impact. And in that case, we are also looking for collaborative activities. So can we implement the results from the European Parliament, the Commission, the GPI Oceans, all that information. And I know from GPI Oceans that there is already the contact and they will participate in the next meetings. And um, the working group submerged from uh, Helcom. 
to get more information from that area. It's always a little bit of a struggle. What can we share from the European Parliament and the European Commission with all the NATO partners? Because yeah, NATO is bigger than only Europe. It's always a challenge you have to do to deal with. And the other group is the European Defense Agency, which is even a smaller group of countries. So, very briefly, what are the detection techniques which are going on? I think it's a lot of work going on on how can we determine the thickness of the ammunition when we dig it up and we have it on our desk in the laboratory, because that's still the most funny thing to work on it. And how can we uh, modeling the corrosion? And I must say, we did some work in this case for the, the ammunition uh, from the Oosterschelde. And we saw big differences depending on the location and the state of the ammunition when it was dumped. Was it in a box or was it as a separate article? And I have to hurry, and I think I have only one or two slides. Uh, another one is the passive sampler, from which is done in the work from SIRDEP by uh, ERDC in Fixburg. And I think this is a way you can place your collector in different conditions, sampling the water the whole time, and analyze afterwards your materials. And just to trigger something in the discussion, I put here some questions which we can address later on. But still, it's always the question, is it always necessary to remove all the seed ammunition? Is it safe? What is the environmental impact? These are two issues which are for us very important in the Netherlands because of the fisher fishermen. And most of the ammunition which is dumped, we don't know the composition and the history. And then starting a model is always a challenge. And that ends my presentations. And I want to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to present this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's also very good to have this insight, but also to address the open questions, which we can then pick up later on in the discussion round, because this is uh, also, one of the topics we have, what science has to do in future. But now, I want to hand over to the next speaker. And uh, I'm very delighted that uh, Catherine Warner will give you an insight also about nature activity. So this is also something very special, I think, for me, that science and military are sitting here together and addressing this topic jointly. Please. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. It's certainly a pleasure for me to be here and to be able to represent NATO, not just my center, but um, NATO as a whole. And I um, also have to say this is the first time I've um, spoken in public in probably two years, and then, so I'm pretty happy that I don't have to unmute or be in charge of unmuting my computer, which I almost always forget to do. Uh, I also want to thank um, Geomar and especially um, Jens for the uh, awesome trip I took on Sunday to, on the um, RV Litorina to the Goldberger Haida. Um, and I learned quite a bit about their um, research and much more than I ever knew about um, uh, munitions that were dumped in the sea. So the, the title of my talk today is Munitions and Explosives of Concern and uh, Research and Engineering Activity that the, uh, NATO is doing. And when I'm talking about MEC, as we'll say, that includes unexploded ordnance, which are usually from firing ranges or weapons that didn't work, and then they were dumped into the ocean, or purposely disposed military munitions, DMM, as they're also called, um, these were without fuses uh, dumped on purpose into the ocean. And then also bulk material and shipwrecks. So kind of encompasses everything, not just UXO. So that's why I'm using the term munitions and explosives of concern. Um, okay, this is my slide. Okay, so I was asked to give just an, an overview of science and technology in NATO. So I tried to um, put here you know, as a very um, high level 
what, what are the organizations in NATO that are, um, are actually doing uh, science and technology? So uh, there's the Science and Technology Organization, which has a chief scientist, and his office is in Brussels, and his job is to advise the Secretary General uh, on um, items of, obviously, you know, concerning science, things like climate change, and also topics such as this, um, munitions in the sea. Um, then there's a collaboration support office, which um, Willem de Klerk uh, spoke of, which is in Paris, and that brings together scientists from different nations uh, that do research studies together. And then there's the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation, that's where I'm from, and it's actually the only laboratory in NATO that exists. So we have scientists, um, researchers, and we have also an engineering department, and we have two research vessels. And we've been in place about s over 60 years. We celebrated our anniversary a few years ago. It, to, um, so we have a great um, experience and knowledge in doing science and at sea which uh, anybody here that does that knows that it's really hard to do and it's really expensive to do. So NATO decided to have us as their only uh, lab because it makes much more sense for the nations to come together to do this type of research. Um, there's also in the NATO headquarters an office within the Emerging Security and Challenges Office called the Science for Peace and Security. They uh, fund uh, various uh, projects uh, within um, the entire uh, European and outside of NATO community. And we participated with them in an experiment um, called the Monitoring of Dumped Munitions Threat or Modem. And that's why I brought my, my um, show and tell here. So <laughs> this is the book that was produced from those studies that were done in uh, 2013 to 2016. This was uh, primarily looking at chemical weapon site dumps, uh, but um, and also looking at, at establishing a, mo a monitoring system. Now, the Allied Command Transformation, uh, which originally was known as the, the, the SACLANT, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander of the Atlantic, is now called Allied Command Transformation. They are uh, responsible for funding much of the, the um, R&D in NATO. So they, they sponsor the maritime s and program of work at our center, and, and that includes the mine countermeasures technology development that I'm gonna speak about today that applies uh, to the um, munitions and explosives of concern. And then there's the NATO Communications and Information Agency, which also has a small uh, science and technology um, center, uh, I think they're in The Hague, actually located in, I think, the same building with TNO. And um, most of their research uh, focuses on command and control, but again, because they were part of SACUR in the very beginning, uh, so they were looking at command and control systems, but they're now they're also doing a lot of artificial intelligence and work in the data sciences. Okay, so I've talked a little bit already about um, this project, uh, but I, I did want to add that um, they did, the book book does um, end up with a, a um, an affordable a network um, with a portable uh, laboratories and using ROVs, AUVs, research vessels, basically to monitor these dumped munitions. And in the, the, this time frame of the 2013 to 2016, at that time, the chemical warfare um, agents were not thought to be a problem. Now, I think s data gathered since then has shown that, that indeed they, they, these things that are leaking out are indeed a problem. Um, there, these, this, of course, has been followed on by many of the projects that were spoken about today, which are, for example, the Daemon in the EU and the other countries that participated along with CMRE were uh, Poland, Denmark, Estonia, Canada, Sweden, Lithuania, Finland, Germany, Belgium, and Russia, and uh, Poland in particular continued to do a lot of work through their Ministry of Higher Education. So this is the work that uh, Willem de Klerk just spoke about. Um, again, I just wanted to show another sample of what kind of research NATO is doing. So this is the the uh, research task group um, that uh, is looking at now gathering the best practices um, using NATO and non-NATO data, 
Uh, I've, I've added here, you know, the, the chair of the panel is Professor Cummings and the co-chair is Klaus Bouchker, who is here, sorry if I said your name wrong, <laughs> and William de Klerk, also a panel member who is here, the nations that are involved, and I also wanted to add that CMRE is also involved in this project. So if, just a couple of examples of some of the work we're doing here at, um, at, at my center. Is, uh, is using um, one of the newer areas of artificial intelligence, which is the uh, neural networks. Uh, and in this case, I'm talking about convoluted neural networks, which is when you have many different ones that you, you put together. So um, I don't think I can use a laser, I guess. If, if you look in the top left corner, this is a synthetic aperture sonar picture taken of a mine shape on the seafloor. Uh, given our, our history of um, marine expo exploration uh, using robotics, we have about 10 years of synthetic aperture sonar data. So this is a very sufficient amount of data to start um, doing training on automatic target recognition. And you know, immediately a human would start thinking of, oh, well, here's the shadow and here's the edge. But interestingly, computers can actually figure out themselves what are good um, facets to build their neural network on. So in this picture um, on the bottom right hand side is the performance of our classifier for this particular system. And so the pink curve would show you the, um, the probability of classification up, up the left side and then um, the false alarm rate across the right side. So the pink curve is with no artificial intelligence. And now the curves that go up further um, to, to, the, uh, to the, the top um, left are when I start combining um, all the different neural networks uh, uh, together and using um, simulated data as well as real data. And for me, that's very interesting on this next um, project, which uh, I've spoke about, well, actually, Dr. Bradley spoke about uh, this morning, is this volumetric synthetic aperture sonar. So this sensor is is a, a downward-looking synthetic aperture sonar, whereas most most of them are side scan, and um, is built by Penn State um, uh, Applied Research Lab, and we were able to take their data. So now, when they're looking down, that gives you the third dimension versus the the two D that we have from side scanning. So, but we were able to take their data and add it into our data. And again, um, by looking at the curves on the right-hand side, you can see that we could improve our um, detection performance to looking at um, unexploded ordnance and identifying it. Uh, so it looks like I'm running out of time. So I'm very lucky that Dr. Bradley has already spoken to you about the uh, Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program and that we are developing one at the center. So the Mediterranean one he spoke about is uh, being developed currently at uh, CMRE. And um, just to keep on going here, I just want to show you. He showed you this picture, but here, here's um, literally this is the view from my office. So this is a ba our basin here has already extensive instrumentation because of course we're doing a lot of underwater communications and so we have network already down there um, up on the top of the hill there we have um, some uh, transceivers uh, and so we can do RTK which gives you the position uh, accuracy of, in the centimeter range and again we have a very large experience um, and the fundamental research under the sea. So we've already done uh, some sea grabs, and this is uh, basically showing you that same area. But the bathymetry of you know the blue is is the clay, and the and the orange is the silt, and the and the um, yellow is the gravel. So it's mostly clay when you get out away from the land. And uh, so interesting. Part of our project, of course, is once we build the range, we need people to come and use it to see if it works. And so uh, for two years, we will be having open weeks. Um, and so I'm hoping that here, uh, by telling you all about this, that you will be interested in coming. We have already some um, uh, uh, companies or, um, and organizations that have expressed interest. Uh, but we are certainly looking for more. Again, we're going to be doing this um, for two years to uh, in 22 and in 23.
um, take home message. Um, again, we're the only uh, research lab in the Alliance. And again, because doing science at sea is hard, so therefore collaboration is, is really um, a, a much better way to go about it. Uh, we have uh, extensive research and engineering capabilities at our center in La Spezia, and we do cooperate extensively with the European Union and, and European Commission projects. And so my very last slide, thank you for listening. Uh, sorry if I took up too much time. Um, uh, we can talk later uh, when I'm off stage about, um, in addition to the test bed, we have two workshops that we will be giving, which will be analyzing data and also talking about the technologies that we've developed at our center. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, unfortunately, I'm retiring at the end of the year, otherwise I would have taken your offer to come to La Spezia, and it's really a nice place you're working in, so thank you for that insight and uh, invitation to the group, really, for joint activities. The last speaker is now Professor Edmund Maser. Um, Yep. Yeah, mother, right. and uh, <laughs> director of the Institute of Toxicology and Pharmacology, and he will give us an insight, I think, about projects running in the last years here in, in Germany about the effect of TNT and the metabolites in the marine food web. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hans, for this nice introduction. Uh, also, I thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of our results. So, uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Um, thank you. So, as you can see from, uh, so the topic, of course, is toxicology, and I will comment on the toxicology, toxicological risk of seed plant munition, and I wonder if I make it in 10 minutes for the short introduction. I hope I can keep the time. So, as you see in the bottom from, uh, from the first slide, I'm from the University Medical School, so we are interested in the effect on humans of this TNT and all this explosive, explosive stuff and also on the environment. And um, it is already known that besides uh, the threat of uh, being uh, uh, or the, the, the danger of, of explosions, we have the risk of environmental damage because all these um, uh, ammunition vessels, they are corroding and they release their toxic compounds into the environment. And um, this sketch sh should show you that uh, these compounds enter then uh, not only the, the surrounding water, but also the sediment. And finally, these compounds find their way into animals living there on the seafloor or swimming there around. And one should be aware of the fact that this is the origin of the marine food web. So the question is then, what is about the human seafood consumer? Is he in danger? Can we still uh, eat our seafood today, our mussels and our fish? And I would like to invite you uh, to join me with some specific uh, approach which we did in our lab and maybe give an answer if seafood is safe today uh, or not. So when it comes to the toxicity, we know that all this stuff is toxic. We know this from uh, lots of uh, experiments and uh, observations. And it is known that uh, the, the humans are affected, the blood, the liver, the eyes, the skin, and nervous system are, uh, could be affected by this explosive stuff. And what is important is that these compounds are mutagenic and they are cancerogenic. So these uh, substances can cause cancer. And what about the ecotoxicity? We know it from lab studies. We have significant toxicity from marine plants, crabs, mussels, worms, fish. And what we still could not evaluate until now for 100% is the question, if these substances find their way into the food chain, which is, of course, possible. We have indications for this. But the, the real problem at, the ti at this time is difficult to estimate because we have too little data. So we are involved in a variety of projects, and I want to just focus on one of these projects, the UDEM project, which was financed by the VNBF. And just, I would give you the, the most important results. So we invented at this time the biomonitoring by using blue muscles. So what does this mean, biomonitoring with blue muscles? You see this Kohlberger Heide outside the Kiel Bay, where we had our experimental field. So we constructed moorings and we positioned these moorings then with lifting bodies and muscles and nets uh, via, via the help of divers at corroding mines. So this sketch shows you that these muscles are exposed directly at a corroding mine. And just give you the, the most important results. 
the closer the muscles were placed to the mines, the higher was the concentration of these munition compounds in the muscles, which had been collected three months after the uh, initial exposure. So we had a second scenario, and this was quite interesting, because we have in the Kohlberg Heide not only this bulk of uh, 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 corroding mines, we have also craters. So in these craters were the result from blast-in-place operations. And these blast-in-place operations are full, uh, it's a field of chunks of munition compounds of hexanite, sometimes in the a, in a, in a, in a size of a basketball. So in our second scenario, we positioned our uh, muscles then close to a bulk, to a chunk of free-lying hexanite, so devoid of rusting material. And what we found was that these muscles contained 50 times higher levels of munition compounds. And this is of relevance. So now we have some data. We have a, con a concentration X and we have a concentration X uh, a point uh, 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 or five, uh, 50, and then uh, from the toxicological point of view, it is not only, uh, we should not only stop with analytics, but now the toxicological uh, risk assessment is of very importance. And this should tell us then, have we a risk for the human seafood consumer? Is the ecosystem impaired? And what about the entry into the food chain? So there are lots of toxicological models and calculation models. I will not go into the detail, I use one semester to teach my students about this uh, scenario. I uh, refrain from doing this here, but I come directly to the results. So when we did a toxicological uh, analysis and a risk assessment, we found that the mussels close to the mines could still be eaten, so there is no risk for the human seafood consumer. However, when we look at the muscle itself, so the health of the muscles are affected. So we developed uh, some molecular biomarkers and we found that the muscles suffer from oxidative stress. But what about the muscles at the free-lying chunk of hexanite? So this is a completely different scenario because we found with the toxicological calculation model that it is not okay if you consume these muscles at a free-lying chunk of, uh, 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 because the munition compounds bear a carcinogenic risk for the sea com uh, seafood consumer and the concentrations we found should lead to the message, please do not eat these muscles when they are exposed directly at free-lying hexanite. So what about fish? So um, I borrowed one slide of uh, Jörn Schasak and the guys from the Thun Institute because they found explosives in flatfish and dabs, plays, and flounder near the Kohlberger Heide dumping area. And when they looked into the tissues, they found that the explosives were concentrated in the bile, but not in the muscle tissue, not in the filly. And this is good because we do not eat the bile, we, we, we eat the muscle tissue. So from the toxicological point of view, there's no risk uh, for the humans to, uh, to eat fish. And this is a very important message. As for now, the uh, consumption of fish, seafood, and mussels is safe. But uh, we should consider that uh, corrosion is going on, and I will come to this point a little later. So, uh, but also here, as we saw with the mussels that the health is uh, impacted, we also have here signs that the, the health of the fish was compromised because the guys from uh, Thunen detected tumors in 25% of the fish they caught in this area near Kohlberger Heide. So, uh, when it comes to the toxicity and the TNT, there's a lot of data available where, when it comes from lab studies. So these are lab studies, not studies in the free field. And if you look at the right column here, you see that all these animals, which are uh, named on the left column, are affected by via concentrations of 1 or 2 or maybe uh, uh, 1.8 milligrams. So this is, this is something we should bear in mind. On the milligram per liter level, then animals in the marine environment are affected regarding their health. And just as an example, I want to focus your attention on fish. Because infant fish, when they are in the presence, 24 hours in the presence of 3 milligram per liter of TNT, they die. All fish die. And now uh, we had this Udin project, which I already mentioned, and the colleagues from the GEOMA, they measured directly the TNT concentration at these chunks of free-lying hexanite. And they measured 3 million nanogram. So you should know that 3 million nanogram is equivalent to 3 milligram. So if I was a fish, then I would not place my eggs in a free 
flat or in the, in the surrounding water. I would look for a cleft, I would looking for a cave, and maybe I would look just for a corroding mine and put my eggs here. But what is then the result? All the infant fish that came out of the eggs will die because they find here the three milligram per liter of toxic uh, substances. And this is something we should consider in the future, and therefore my conclusions. The explosives from damped munitions are toxic, they are carcinogenic. Currently, there's no acute risk for the human seafood consumer, but the explosive explosives already today endanger marine ecology and diversity, and this is a very important point. So and in principle, they may affect the humans by entering the marine food chain, because the future corrosion on the metal shells will increase the problem in the future. Maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, we may have a completely different scenario. So the recovery of dumped munition must begin immediately and must be accompanied by biomonitoring. And this is important because now we have the possibility via magnet resonance and everything what they do uh, with the corroding shells, say the metal is there and you could detect, detect now even uh, undetected uh, munition items on the seafloor. And then when it comes to the blast in place operations, I showed you the picture where the free lying chunks of hexanite were in these craters. So the message is don't blast. If it, not, if it is not absolutely necessary, please don't blast. Do this, don't do these operations because you scatter all these compounds and all these chunks on the seafloor and then they, uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, scenario increases then and, um, and, uh, and crafts the problem then for uh, the marine life. So what uh, is the demand for the future? So we should further look on the distribution of munition compounds within the marine environment. There's still a, la a lack of data which we should fill the gaps. Uh, we should look into the problem of the entry of munition compounds in the marine food web. We do not know enough at the moment. So we must detail our risk assessment for the human seafood consumer when it comes to crabs and other species. And we should develop molecular biomarkers as an early warning system. And one important point is the last one, the microbial bioremediation. So we are looking at the hotspots. We are now discussing possibilities for remediation via techniques, via recovery machines and automatic systems. But we have a lot of compounds and lo a lot of small items lying there on the seafloor. And maybe our microbes will help us to get rid of this via complete biomineralization. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Edmund Mather, thanks a lot. Also for these clear conclusions. But we are now getting into the discussion round, so it's open also for you to address your questions. I think there's a microphone over there, uh, if you like to really ask questions. But my question first would be by the clear statement now by Edmund Mather that clearance is in an important topic, and we had the statement by uh, Wim de Klerk that is it always really the best way to really clear the activity? So what to do, how give, how is the advice to the politicians in the specific areas, what is the best approach? How really can this be handled? So who should, you're, you're the chairman, you should decide. Yeah, maybe, maybe just Wim, if you can start. Uh, yeah, maybe to start, I think it's depending on the situation, how deep is the place where the ammunition is, uh, is dumped. When we look in the Netherlands, we did the calculation when we want to remove the 30,000 ton in the Oosterschelde. We have a big impact on the environment for all the fishermen, for the mussel areas. And only the calculation is between 6 and 10 billion euro to remove it. Because places are 60 meter deep. So. I think in such situation, maybe it's better to leave it, and but look for a good monitoring system. But so um, my impression is that we have in the Baltic uh, a very good um, opportunity to bring together all the things that are already available to now. So we already know 
that uh, the substances are toxic and carcinogenic. And we know uh, the hotspots. We know some of the hotspots. We do not know all the hotspots. And what I learned in the past, and what, what maybe will be, the, the, will be the result of this Kiel Munition Clinics Week, is to bring the people together uh, and to have a joint initiative and starting at the hotspot. So, for example, the Kohlberger Heide, where we have 50,000 tons of munition items uh, scattered there or even in, in huge amounts. And, and, and uh, uh, I think this could be a good starting point to use already the technology is available. We will hear about it in the coming days. And to start, and now the question is from the politicians. Uh, of course, we need money for this. And uh, we have several approaches uh, on, on, the, on the federal uh, level. And uh, um, maybe uh, we could convince now the politicians uh, to open the purse and put some money there, which is necessary to have a starting point. And yes, yeah, start with the with hotspots and the clearance of the hotspots and to learn in the Baltic, and maybe to extend our knowledge then to other areas worldwide. So, especially in the Baltic, we are quite aware about the hotspots, or do we need a better monitoring system and, and, and better detection uh, approaches, or how are we really situated in this way? Maybe Katja Mattis could uh, just explain how far, really, from, from the scientific side, uh, the approaches are how science are really prepared to monitor the Baltic area in this respect? Well, uh, I think we are very well advanced. We know, uh, we know the hotspots. I've, I've shown the hotspots. Uh, we know where the munition is. And as I, as I have shown, or as uh, Edmund Maza also showed from the Kohlberger Heide or the Lübeck Bay, these are um, areas, pilot areas, where we could start um, extracting the, the munition and, and learn for it. But um, I mean, all the, all the projects that have been um, done so far, BMBF projects or also EU projects, we heard about BASTA, Exprotect, um, we, we have quite a, a good knowledge and we have mapped several key areas in the Baltic um, and we, we are ready to start. <laughs> Not we, but um, of course we need uh, the cooperation with industry to to remove the munition. So, in cooperation, what about international cooperation? I think it was addressed also in the morning several times how important international cooperation is. And what I personally feel very optimistic is that we have here the different uh, stakeholders on board, the military and the science, and how can we really improve this cooperation? Because normally, science and military are two sides of a coin, and a lot of scientific institutions are afraid to cooperate with military. But I think this topic can only be really handled if there is a close cooperation. So is there any further steps to be taken to improve the situation, or are we already there where we want to be? Should, yeah. should I start? Well, I will tell you that at least for NATO, uh, and I think that um, encompasses most of the, the European navies and then also in North America, United States and Canada, um, is the, the military has embraced the science and technology because we are now bringing them you know, innovative solutions. I mean, they're not out buying 50 new mine sweepers because they can't afford them. They're, they're, they're taking these un autonomous underwater vehicles that have artificial intelligence built into them to find mines in warfare. And um, obviously these munitions and explosives of concern that we're looking at in the seas are there because of the military. <laughs> so I do not think that there is any a uh, question that th this will be a joint effort. I think someone said, you know, well, we're, we're going to have industry that's going to find them and map out where they are, uh, which I completely support because even though we know where the hotspots are, we know that they've moved there. So there, there may be, you know, 80% of them here, but 20% of them have moved and are buried and, and we're still going to have to find them. Um, so industry developing the best technology, but I do in the end think that it will probably be the military that has to 
dispose of them. And that's also gonna take some science because we're not there yet. I mean, I completely agree with you. We need to get them out of the water, but how do we do that safely? And, um, you know, that's what we have scientists, you know, to come to an innovation to, for, to do. And um, it is definitely part of the Secretary General's NATO 2030 vision to have the civil military cooperation. And he's also talking about this innovation hub that, that's across Atlantic. And, you know, that would be something that could bring the best and brightest together to think about this. Okay. But also for my personal feeling, I think on the, in Germany, we are quite well advanced in this cooperation. And uh, for that, I'm really looking forward to this is really moving on. Exactly. Or are there any kind of uh, wishes from the scientific side, from the mm -hmm. university or from GEOMA, which you would like to address now? Uh, from my point of view, I just want to say that uh, it is... Uh, on the opportunity of this week, the Kiel Munition Clearance Week. So this is, this is one occasion where we can learn a lot, where we can have a lot of exchange. And I'm very enthusiastic to learn what will be then the final result after, uh, on, on Thursday evening then. Because here we have now the military, we have the industry, we have the scientific people here. And uh, as far as I see from the program, this is very well organized because it leaves room for networking. So the lunch breaks are uh, large enough and, and also the coffee breaks and all the evenings organized, everything is uh, organized. And I learned from, Mary, from many uh, scientific, scientific uh, conferences that networking is the most important. And so far, I'm very happy that we could meet here in person and exchange wine with a cup of coffee or even with a beer. And, uh, and uh, not only this, this official uh, uh, meeting uh, is, is very important, but yesterday, for example, we had this satellite meeting regarding the JBIO and the Knowledge Hub. And we had very uh, extensive uh, exchange with knowledge and also people from around Europe have been sitting there and we're discussing all aspects of uh, detection, of mapping, of clearance and toxicological problems. And we were sitting with uh, 30 people at a long table there, we're discussing everything. And this is uh, something we should uh, uh, further then. Are there any questions from the audience? Please. The microphone, I think, is a in, in little bit behind the camera. Okay. You understand Denmark. I started working, investigating some, something of chemical munition about 12 years ago. I very fast learned that... Sorry. I, I was very quick to learn that don't rely on the internet. Go for the original <laughs> sources. <laughs> So I've spent a lot of time in the National Archives in the UK. And in this process, I have also seen a lot about the dumping of high explosive ammunition. And I'm a bit surprised that you in Germany say we have 1.6 million tons of high explosive ammunition dumped after the war. If I put the, my figures together, and they are not complete, I can't make it more than half a million ton. That was what's dumped. The, mun the munition was confiscated by the allies, allies. And in the early 50s, the German industry was hungry for scrap. So the German government approached the British government and by treaty, they tr transferred the ownership of the ammunition and the wrecks to the G federal German government by August the 15th, 1953. But your question was that you are coming up with your analyzers to lower numbers. But I yep. think these 1.6 million is not only what was done during the Second World War, but it's what also there from before, so from the First World War or whatever. And as far as I know, this was a very thorough analysis of these documentation about um, transport and, and, and everything. So this is a very thorough analysis of the documents available for dumping munition in the sea, but it's a cumulative number 
of all the munition in the German waters, as far as I know, or Klaus Böttcher must uh, really <laughs> correct me. But if I could also add, I mean, yeah. it didn't stop in 1953. They, they, not until the 1970s did they stop dumping the munitions in the sea. And, and we suspect that even into the 80s, some countries were still dumping. Yeah. But thank you for this uh, comment, because always uh, a thorough analysis of the documentation is needed, and I think by that we really have to bring these data together. And this was also the topic yesterday on the Knowledge Hub on munition from JP Ocean. It's very important, really, to collect the information which is available mm. and to make these also accessible to everybody. And I think it was also addressed in the morning that this is the most important point, that we also exchange the information we have on the different national levels. And it's not really easy because it's of often in the national language. And for that, it's very hard, really, to bring this information together. But I think this is something which also the Knowledge Hub of JP Ocean will take care on later on. So we will hear tomorrow, I think, about this uh, topic uh, more in detail. But uh, one thing was the state of research, but what is the request? What is needed? What kind of research activities are really needed for the future to get more clarity, to, to get a better overview, and to give better advices to the politicians what to do. But by that, I would like to start with Katja Mattis uh, about this thing. What is the request of science for the future? <laughs> what is the, the request for, for science for the future? Um, <clears throat> may I just add um, one more comment to the international um, cooperation that, that we just talked about? I think um, it's really important, um, this international cooperation and um, the JPI Oh, Knowledge Hub um, is an important first step. And really, I agree with Edmund Mazar that says talking that science and military is talking together at this event and hopefully further on this um, as really um, important. So um, what do we need um, for the future? I think we need international calls um, for industrial and scientific projects in an open competition um, and this needs to be organized and synchronized by different na national and international funding agencies um, because as as we all know um, there is not only a mission in, in german waters um, there are a couple of eu projects but um, there's also um, specific questions to solve the problem that should involve national and international authorities. And um, this, is, this is so important to have the stakeholder dialogue from the, from the beginning on in, in these projects. So we really need to bring people together from different um, communities, military, science, but also the authorities and um, <clears throat> and of course industry um, in order to to really um, have the technology to uh, to take out the mission. That are um, from the podium here, Wim. Yeah, what do we need? I think we need uh, the, the cooperation in setting up the models for uh, corrosion and detection for the different. Uh, ways we have to work for deep water, uh, in deep water, salt water, fresh water, etc. In case that we don't more, we can look in which areas it's the most critical part and start with that uh, cleaning area and later on taking the, let's say, less uh, imported areas. So the modeling? The yeah, I think we need the modeling. Uh, yeah, AI is one of the things you can do more. Uh, yeah, it will give an overview because we will not be able to pick up in all locations enough munition and uh, to analyze it. Yeah. Catherine, are there any requests from your side? Sure. Well, um, I can say one area that we are looking at very, very nascent uh, um, research is a uh, type of, um, of um, synthetic aperture sonar that is at such a frequency that it can look inside um, 
what it can penetrate, you know, your shell, and so we know for sure. I mean, there, there's a lot of trash on the seafloor as well as as munitions, so that we don't waste our time, you know, picking up refrigerators and um, you know tires and things like that. So that is is a, an area of research that will take some time to to be fully developed and also have the the automatic target recognition associated with it. But it seems to me, my from gathering this morning that what we really need to, to, to understand better is the remedi remediation methods. Um, can they be done in, in situ uh, and not, you know, can, can, can we somehow freeze them, bury them in concrete or come up with some new material that's gonna keep them where they are and not, and not a, a, a endanger the environment or do we need to come up with some other type of robotic systems that can encapsulate them and, and bring them above because I think most of the research has really been detecting, locating, classifying, and monitoring. And we really haven't been talking about, okay, now, what are we gonna do? Because we monitored them, and that's a problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> what to do then? I, I really think that there could be some very interesting, um, innovative uh, emerging technologies there. Mm. So by that, we need a very close cooperation with industry, really. Of course. To yeah get innovation in, in this research. Absolutely. I think all, not just industry, but you know, the scientists that are in this area and also um, naval EOD officers. I mean, they, they have ideas as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, the US used to use dolphins and sea lions to do these kinds of things. So maybe we have some sort of bio uh, mimicking uh, ro robotics. I don't know. I, I just think that's a, that's a good area to look in. Okay. Professor Maza. Yeah, from the toxicological perspective, I would say that we should enhance our research when it comes to the toxic effects of the environment, the marine environment, and this will automatically uh, lead to the f marine food web and the bioaccumulation or bioconcentration along the marine food web, and ultimate, ultimately end then on the, for, uh, on the human seafood consumer. So we need a lot of data, and these data could also be models. So there are food web models already available, which should be employed, but they need these, these models need data to be used. And this is what we, what we should focus on. Uh, to provide this data in the field, not in the lab, in the field. This is very important. We have data from the lab, but we need data from the field. And then once we can feed the models, then we can uh, anticipate what is coming in the future. And maybe one is the, the, uh, the time point when the, there is a really threat for the human seafood consumer in 10 or 20 years. By the way, of course, we should already start now with the, with the, with the recovery of all these things. But uh, I can say that we, uh, with, uh, under the guidance of Jens Kreiner from the GEOMA, we have an application on, uh, with the CONMAR uh, project, and this covers a lot of that, what I just explained, and uh, we hope that uh, the project will come real. It should start in December, but the final decision is uh, on the way, I hope. And after these three years, I think we know, uh, know a, lot, a lot of more, uh, uh, lots of things more than or better, and to make this calculation and this modeling then. Okay, thank you for this overview on future needs. There's one question over there. Yeah. Jens Greinert. Ah, Jens. The microphone, please. Yeah, yeah. Now it's on, okay. Uh, yeah, very interesting discussion. So I think what we need is, we, we did a lot of research, so that's good. We showed it and we will show even more of what we have done. But we have a lot of tools already. We just have to do it. And that's what I'm missing. And this is where the local or national authorities actually come in. I mean, uh, yesterday I had a very nice discussion with, with our Navy, with the, with the Fregattenkapitän, and we immediately got an idea, okay, we go out jointly in the Lübeck Bay and look what is in these boxes. We don't know this yet. We know where the boxes is. We know how many torpedoes are lying around. We just have to do more. We, we just have to do it. We don't have to... We also need research, of course. If I'm a researcher. If I say we don't need research anymore, I would be stupid. I hope I'm not <laughs> so stupid. Uh, but doing it and, and making, it, making it, a, uh, it a joint effort, I think that's the important part. Going out and measuring. We don't have the data. That's what Eddie Maza just said. How should we explain or how should we come to the conclusion whether we have to take the munition out or not? if we don't have the data. I mean, we have now three years of measuring uh, munition compounds in the Baltic Sea along the German coast only. Three, three surveys we had. But 
this is not enough to say, okay, which is really the hotspot uh, where we have to st uh, start. Well, so we need a kind of case study or whatever. We need really monitoring, not a case monitoring. study. A case study is what you do once and then the case is mm. over. We need long-term monitoring. Okay. And this is where the okay. national authorities have to join in because Geoma is a research center. We do research. We are not doing monitoring out in the sea. So this is what local authorities, what the Landesministerien or the... Exactly. Uh, so it's Umwelt a clear request from science, really, to the authorities for, for future activities. Thank you for that. I see there are two more persons who want to address questions, and uh, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for this nice uh, activity and uh, meeting. And my name is Hans Sanders. I come from Morse University in Denmark. Uh, of course, uh, when you start to clear munition, you're doing uh, risk management. So th what you really need is a sound site-specific risk assessment of the risk you're going to manage. We don't really have that for, for sea dump munitions uh, today. Uh, we have holes in our knowledge. Uh, we have some hotspots that we know something about. But to have a clear uh, site-specific quantitative risk assessment that you can then design your remediation activities around, which can be leave it as it is or pick stuff up so that you make sure that you, you hit the targets that you need. And this is, of course, also related to, uh, to the zero pollution policy from the Commission. So, so we need to get some clear indications also uh, with regards to what is our protection aims uh, from a political point of view that we should uh, then try to target in, uh, in our risk assessment so that we can indeed know if we need to, uh, to clear the munitions or not. Uh, as, as Wim said, it can be extremely costly to, uh, to do this. I don't know how many governments are willing to spend you know, hundreds of millions of euros or potentially billions of euros on, on solving a problem that hasn't really been quantified okay. yet. Thanks. I think this is a clear message also, but uh, I think it's in line with the monitoring activity. So risk assessment and monitoring, I think, go uh, along with it. Also, Torsten. Yeah. Just to keep it short, I have to watch the clock here. Okay, uh, you know, I wanted to even turn this into an uh, actual question to the panel, which I very much enjoy, actually. Um, so we, I, I also fully agree that we need uh, more research, and of course I'm, I'm Torsten Kiefer from JPA Ocean, so I mean, um, obviously uh, I'm, I'm pushing for that, but maybe we should uh, look at, at research in a, in a broader context. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I sense that uh, also the frustration that Jens Kleinert uh, mentioned uh, from knowledge to, to action, uh, to solving a problem, that always seems to be this, this issue that we say, oh, you know, there's all this knowledge out there. So why doesn't this translate in, in, into action and, and solving the problem? So I wonder whether, in this case, we should turn a little more to social sciences, kind of doing governance studies and governance in the sense of studying what kind of um, interest um, situation there is and the kind of conflicting interest and, and how to, it's possible to bring those under one umbrella and so on. So maybe if it, it this is a research session now, um, so is there anything happening on the governance situation or the, the, or the, or the interest uh, conflict situation um, in the field of uh, clearing munition in the sea? Who want to answer this aspect. Katja Mattis, can you give an information <laughs> about that? I can, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure I can answer uh, the question um, completely, but I, I agree. Um, so from, from knowledge to action, um, to the solution of the problem, that's, that's the key. Um, I, I think we can, can learn um, really from the Corona pandemic. We've seen how much science um, has pushed the, the knowledge and how it has helped. Um, and I, I think, at least in, in Germany, um, we, the, the problem of munition in marine waters is on the political agenda, very high up. You've seen the minister president um, talking about it. Um, so, so I think we can use it, and, and as Jens uh, Greinert said, um, if, we, if we go out to Lübeck Bay or to Kohlberger Heide, if we start um, and we have this, this little pilot um, area, then I think we have something in our hands that we can really show and solve the problem. And, and there are projects also with um, 
uh, ThyssenKrupp, um, who has the technology to um, to get this munition out in a safe way, um, of course. So I think it's it's really starting little and then maybe scaling it up to um, to a larger area. Okay, thank you for this uh, maybe very can... impressive answer. I just have two more questions, I think, and I have only five minutes to go. So just very shortly, very brief question or short comment, whatever. Okay. Uh, Jacek Bodowski, Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. So uh, just a very so short question because we had JPIO in the room, we've got NATO. So uh, right now there have been some projects in US, some projects uh, in EU and some national projects here and there. But uh, do you foresee any like a fully international cooperation on munition in terms of research? I think this is for Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think already there's many um, of the European Commission project. I think Demon and Demon Two were mentioned. Um, NATO Science for Peace and Security has sponsored many mu multinational uh, projects on on the monitoring. Um, so now we just have to get into the remediation and the and the uh, implementation but absolutely uh, and nato has secretary general has already pledged um a joint w along with the, the the european commission a joint joint declaration to work t more closely together this so, is, yes this is a very clear statement and now i think the last question last comment by klaus Becher. i think he is more or less the father of everything here <laughs> in germany <laughs> and that's your very why you have the right now still to ask your question Thank you very much. I'm just the vocal hub of our online community, and we had some technical questions about the remains on the seafloor, but one um, is uh, remaining for the concern of marine protection area if we clean up. I think most of them uh, are in place, these protection areas and the legal framework is in place, but I'd like to invite the online community to follow the Munition Clearance Week, and then we'll, we, we will uh, come to these technologies we will use for remediation. And they are safe, and I think there are many statements on that. It's more a statement and an invitation to ask further questions. They will be transferred. So to keep the interest high also for the next sessions, very much thank you for that. And I think science is already now in a situation that they can really supply the information which the decision makers need. And I think, as we heard, it's time for action, it's time really to act and, and to show up what is possible. And we need a little bit of in, in innovation on the um, yeah, clearance activity. Yeah. But I think this is possible. If there's a political will, I think we can go ahead. And thanks for science that they really supplied this necessary information and that they really keep the awareness on the situation and really yeah, I'm looking forward for the next meetings. I think many of the open questions will be asked in the next se sessions. And for that, thank you very much. And I think it's now lunchtime.